Hello, and welcome to Digital Marketing Musings, hosted by Merkel. Each episode, we choose a different expert to discuss the latest and greatest in digital marketing trends. Today, we're interviewing Dave Meager and Zach DeBoard about gaming creative. All right, let's get to it. I'm Gaia Reed, And I'm Andrea McCartney. And this is Digital Marketing Musings. Welcome back to Digital Market Musings Season 2. Today, we're joined by Dave and Zach to talk about gaming creative. Dave Meeker is the head of design and innovation practice for Dentsu's creative service line. Zach is the executive innovation director for Isobar US. Welcome to the show, Dave and Thanks. Zach. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So this episode continues our gaming series, and today we're talking about gaming creative. If you haven't already, we definitely encourage listeners to go back and uh, listen to a few of our recent episodes on Web3, the metaverse, and how brands can get involved in the gaming space as precursor content for this episode. So leading into our first question, uh, (laughs) brands have been creating marketing-based games for a long time. So wondering how has it changed over time and what's happening in this space today? Zach, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, (laughs) I think one of the fascinating things is going back, Dave and I are nearing 50 now. So we grew up with games and gaming is not a fringe thing anymore. Everyone's a gamer. Most consumers are gamers um, to the tune of 80, 90 percent of people casual game. And I think expanding even beyond just gaming platforms, we think of Nintendo Sega, all those uh, uh, gaming platforms, if you will. But games are everywhere. They run on every device. And we can make games in the web. We can make games in any channel. And what's fascinating is once we start to connect those dots and move consumers through experiences that both educate them on, and on products and move them toward valuable goals. Not only are they learning about something, but to be able to transact now, that is something that's new. Adding uh, commerce into the game itself and once again, having that translate into a physical product and meaning beyond just a quick casual game, that's pretty fascinating. And we have the power to connect campaigns, to move people into those channels, and then ultimately closer to the product. Dave, is there anything else you want to add? Just that, you know, 15 years ago, you could get away with making a game and actually releasing it from a branded perspective and the company could have their own fast food game, but the competition has obviously gotten a lot more stronger. There's a zillion choices out there, but what that creates is all these amazing opportunities to integrate brands into other platforms, other kinds of gaming experiences. And now with, you had mentioned the metaverse from a previous show, we do a lot of work in that space and and now it's all getting um, combined, right? So we, we used to talk about like omni-channel web experiences across devices. Now it's almost as if, if we can add gaming into one of those channels. Um, so it's it's great. It's it's obviously more confusing for brands, but it, that's why we're here is to help them navigate these waters. And I'll add, uh, just to add to that, this idea of persistence and that these games, once again, are not ephemeral little uh, one hit kind of wonders or just quick, quick and fun. The game itself can evolve, right? As campaigns change and we change the mechanics, we can move, once again, consumers through these experiences in different ways. So yeah, it's it's always evolving. And we are now hitting a point where the games themselves are becoming incredibly complex with artificial intelligence guiding narratives behind the scenes and at the same time graphics in general are just getting incredible they're starting to move into photo real um and with you know five years or so that whether it's streaming or running on your mobile phone itself that will translate into what consumers see and interact with now and that's a huge shift from five ten years ago And I think uh, we had heard you guys previously mention that like there are games happening today that just don't really feel like games. Can you articulate on that point as well? What do you mean when you you say that? Well, I mean, my perspective on it is that we used to think about user-centered design in all points of digital, right? But with the proliferation of gaming and with everyone being much more connected to each other via social media and through their mobile devices and casual gaming having such a rise amongst a traditional non-gaming population, it's as if now 
our users, right, our consumers that we target have become players. And so when I say that, we're, we're starting to, I mean, everybody's been talking about gamification, which is a word that I think we cringe at a lot of times because game theory and game mechanics and the I, concepts of game design are like an entire discipline by the, their own right. And so gamifying something seems kind of trivial or it, it trivializes sort of the the heft of what really goes into to creation of great games. But we see things like today, uh, shopping experiences can feel like they're a game, right? We can see commerce experiences feel more gamified. And that doesn't have to be the front end experience layer that someone participates in. It can be as, as novel as picking out three products and being unsure which to buy and then floating those out to your friends so that they can vote, right? And 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 suggest which one they think looks best in your space versus what looks best for you. As we start to see things like achievements, as we start to see things like you making choices and, and much more dynamic visual and experiential feedback in the apps that we use and just kind of better experiences, right? The, the web and mobile have come a long way in 15 years. I don't know why I keep using 15 years as my benchmark here, but it feels like Web 2 started then and now we're moving into this world of Web 3. So as Zach had mentioned, like with the power of graphics processors and browsers and the way we're able to deliver content, I mean, I would suspect that a lot of more serious apps feel a lot more gaming-like because of just the types of interfaces that we'll be able to build. I had an experience a couple of weeks ago where we were looking at technologies for dashboards. Like who thought a, a dashboard would be built in Unreal Engine? But that's where we're moving, right? So the technologies that powered video games are now being pulled forward to power other types of experiences, whether that be a car configurator or a virtual you know, meeting or something as mundane or historically mundane as a, as a data dashboard, but now is in 3D and can respond to your gestures or voice. So it's all kind of converging. I think that's good. I think it also means that you need to really focus on where do you invest your money to build the right experiences for the right budget? Because you could go crazy using bells and whistles that you don't necessarily need to build a great experience. So it's a big balance. And I think agencies are, are in the midst of that right now, trying to figure out how do you do this? How do you move forward with these technologies, but do so in a way that's fiduciary responsible and creates great experiences for, for, for players, not users, uh, on behalf of their clients? Yeah. And I mean, I, I tend to think already, I, I'm kind of stuck in this thinking because we work in the ad industry that a game isn't about building Fortnite for us. It's a sequential experience. So the ad is the call to adventure. It piques your interests. And then the next step is education. You need to learn a little bit about what that product is we just told told you about. Dave talked about validation. All right. Well, now you've piqued my interest. I'm I'm thinking about this. Do I get blue? Do I get gray? What do you think of these features? Reach out to your your friends, right? And social media. And then moving into purchase. These are all moving through different channels. It could happen on your phone. You might do a little on your desktop. You might hop into VR and drop something um, or even AR in your living room is a really big thing now. Do bring the product and the experience to people. They're not even going anywhere. They're not going to the game. They're bringing the game to their living room, plunking it down and having the experience there. And we can now uh, bring in live help, live agents, bring in those social friends and have a discussion in context, in location with a real size product all the way up to vehicles we do now uh, where people drop a full size vehicle in their living room, and they're able to walk around it, walk inside and out and look at all the details. And once again, if you had your friend there, if you have an agent there, and it, it could be fun too, there could be, let's just say Easter eggs there. Like there's a the, the part of the game is not only are you learning about the product, but let's say you do find the Easter egg and the Easter egg gives you 15% off. Well, that's an incentive then to make that last hop to getting to the dealer, getting to the store, wherever the physical product is and incentivization to finish that. Last thing about that is we can track those consumers through all those channels. And that's where it really gets pretty fascinating because we can change the game, right? So let's say they got through the education part. They did something in their living room. They did that with, with an agent. And from that, we learned 
well, they want it in black and they want these five features and they found this interesting. And later on, they see a commercial maybe made just for them with the same virtual asset. And there's another call to adventure. Uh, hey, did you know that there's only one of these left? There's a scarcity play too. Get down there. Here's another discount code. Let's get you over that last uh, hurdle, if you will, to purchase. Um, and that could be teed up once again within the same narrative. So it all feels connected, but you've changed your path at the end of that game. You're going to have your own finish. And that's driven by data and technology. And once again, reuse of the assets, repackaging and personalization for that end goal. So I'm hearing a lot of really interesting ways that advertisers are needing to design for users. We're talking about it not just being gamification, but also being kind of integrating the user into the like the, almost the design process. Are there any other things that advertisers should be doing or thinking about as they're they're creating these designs and these ideas for their users? I mean, the one thing that I recommend everybody do is get immersed as best as possible in the experiences because we often talk to brands that want to do something and then we come up with a solution and they are they're at step one with understanding what that experience could be like. Oh, let's use a really concrete example. So Zach, you talked about like being able to plop a vehicle or something down in your living room and walk around it. And consumers have become accustomed to using their phone, right? An augmented reality which arguably is pretty powerful and very cool. We do a lot of that work. It's always very exciting. <laughs> but it's just, I mean, scratching the surface of what an experience can be like. So right now with Web3 and the metaverse, what's driving a lot of that is is not only boredom, no, I'm kidding, um, <laughs> is there's a lot of new technologies that we've been using for gaming. We've been using for right. virtual production. And like we're talking about like movie production, things like the Mandalorian, LED walls and, and virtual cameras and things of that nature. All of those technologies are moving so fast and becoming ac accessible to regular production teams. So you got to remember that we're about to experience a whole wave of new hardware. And, w and those take place mostly as headsets of some sort, right? And I think everybody's very shy and going, here's our new great thing. But everybody's taking baby steps because of some of the past, I don't want to say failures, but some of the launches into the into the marketplace over the last decade that kind of thought we were going to a little more fanfare than they did, right? Gla Google Glass right. is an early example. Um, the Bose, you know, audio like glasses, AR devices more recently. But you you know that Google has a new headset, right? You still have Magic Leap producing more industrial, but they'll probably whip back to consumer at some point. You've got Microsoft HoloLens devices, which again are more on the industrial flavor. They're expensive, but they're paving the way for consumer devices. The right. rumor out there is Apple's moving on something as an AR headset, mixed reality headset. And then you're going to have, like I saw yesterday, that the, co the company that is heavily funded that's making contact lenses is a year away from a, la a launch. And so wow. the idea of these types of experiences, like we're, we're finally at a point where removing that last bit of friction for participation is upon us, right? Because when anybody can just visualize 3D content and blend it into their physical space, we move beyond gaming into this world of spatial computing and true mixed reality. That's the kind of stuff that we're really super excited about. Do you have any do you have any examples of like what could be your brands that are thinking about this or is that kind of like buttoned up right now? Well, I'd love to get something tangible. I mean, sure. If you look at the so let, let's go to some of these metaverse spaces. And because we've been working heavily with one called Decentraland, we can talk about that as we launched a brewery for Heineken a month or so ago. Very fun project. But those spaces right now, it's like when you go in, you're on your computer, you're in a you're like a it's sort of a lower poly 3D experience. Unreal Engine has a de new demo. The Detroit studio, is that it, Zach? It's mm -hmm. Detroit something, but it's really good looking. <laughs> it takes the visual experience up a level. But imagine when you can break out of your computer, you don't need to carry a device around to look at the car. You're just standing in front of the car. You, you can enter the beach. You can go into the hotel. You can yeah. visit the virtual store. I think, I don't know, two to five years, we will have an entirely new wave of immersive experiences. And 
like not even to be totally shocking, but I was in a call on Friday where we were talking about we have a partner who's creating a holodeck. And like if you look at all the technologies with like what NVIDIA does with AI and visual processing and voice and you string them all together, <laughs> HD projectors um, in a space yeah. could create like you could I want to be on a beach with whatever, you know, and, and or you look at that's like, so these cool. Yeah. Technologies like OpenAI has this platform, if you haven't seen called Dolly 2. And it's it's a way for text descriptions to render photographic images. I mean, we're at the cusp of AI and neural networks and and then you right, you get to the world of quantum computing. Like our reality and our virtual content become completely married. I don't even I can't even like all experience has become brand experiences at that point, right? I, I think the the challenge we will have is not finding places to play. It'll be counseling clients and customers on how to back off of it and where to be responsible and how do we make a separation between reality and virtual experiences. Right, right. I mean, we're, we're, we're at that doorway from a design perspective, which is super exciting. It's a little crazy. <laughs> Never thought you'd actually arrive here, but here we are. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. I mean, Dave talked a lot about hardware and the hardware is going to open up new types of experiences, but there's still the underlying channels where the content lives. He brought up Heineken and it was a virtual beer launch. They were launching a virtual beer. They wanted to have their full press release virtual. So we built a virtual brewery in Decentraland and you know they own land within Decentraland within a within a virtual world. And that brewery stays. So although there were games and um you know thousands of people showed up simultaneously on launch day, they had a live press event. It ran three times. There were thousands of people at each one. You can see everybody running around. Um, they invited influencers to to bum around the space at the same time. They did find our Easter egg, which was super fun. We had one in a, a virtual brewing tank. And like a, Can you tell us what the Easter egg was? It, it literally was just a, a, the silver Heineken can, and it said Easter egg on it because the whole thing was a, okay. a bit tongue in cheek. Yep. It was there's irony about the, the whole. <laughs> you're launching a virtual beer. You can't actually taste a virtual beer, right? So what what does that actually yeah. mean? So we had some fun with that. With it literally says Easter egg, but they found it, <laughs> and within an hour. There were 40 people having their own little private, like secret party in this this tank, which is so fun to see people find these things we put in, you know, and try to tee up a fun experience on that launch day. So they did it. But the, the point is that content, the building that we designed, and we worked with the head of Heineken's design to design that whole building. Like nothing is random or by chance in that space. It all ladders up to the brand. Some pieces that we built in virtual will be replicated in physical for live events. So there's absolutely parallels. And they're throwing physical events and starting to blend those with virtual events. I think what's important for brands to understand is, once again, that was not an ephemeral thing. It's meant to last. We built a building. They own the land. It stays there. So after press event, different regions around the world can come in and there's a stage. Do they want to hold a concert and stream that in? Do they want to have a meeting? You know, maybe it's even regional based. It's only for Spain. And we have the ability to switch the signage for the whole space so that they can quickly mm. hold events there. The space itself okay. is used. And we did this while building the property to create the content for the advertising we made all the content in the space. The building that we built in virtual became our virtual production platform. So we made avatars of people and had them run through and animated all kinds of characters in there. That became the social media for the space. So mm. once again, this idea of building these spaces with a longer term plan of, all right, but here's how you can use that. Now you've built it. Think about how you would use a real studio. Do it now, but people can come in from home or anywhere, right? And use this space in new ways. So it really unlocks mm -hmm. a large chain of possibilities. And to Dave's point, we come in to help brands know what the right channel is. Um, Heineken came to us with some ideas. They knew what they wanted to do. 
but where should that be? Where where's the audience that we we want to hit? And we weighed different channels. Ultimately, coming through to Centerland is the right mix of things we wanted to hit. And we'll be talking a lot to brands about what's the right cryptocurrency then, you know, to enable commerce. Mm. These things are uh, fairly unregulated, unregulated right now. Um, they can be dangerous, right. especially if campaigns are not properly put together. It exposes consumers to risk and very simple scams. Um, at this point, we take that stuff really seriously. So from the channel itself to the commerce, that's where we come in to set up the guide rails, provide playbooks and a roadmap. Here's how your brand can move into the future. Well, Zach, I mean, and, and maybe I can pause after this because you can determine if you want to talk about this or not, because it's a little ser weird, more serious than what you think of gaming. But like you can go create a game and, P and brands have for a long time. But are you measuring the game, right? Does the game integrate into anything else? The assets for the game that you create, like, can you use them elsewhere? We're taking more of an approach now, I think, as especially as Densu starts to come together and we work more closely across the different, from media to, to Merkle and data and, and customer experience to creative like, what's the ecosystem look like for you? And so right. when we're creating 3D content, we're looking at, like, where else can this content be used across your enterprise from your conferences to print pieces to web to mobile to 3D experiences? And then how does it all tie together? So, for example, if you are a brand that wants to sell a piece of physical merchandise in a game, but in the game you're buying the digital version... Is that an NFT? Is that not? Is it simply a royal loyalty tie-in? How do I fulfill that order in the real world? How do I get you that sweatshirt this afternoon while it appears on your avatar right now? Like it starts right. to become much more complicated than, hey, let's build a game. And so you have to start to have connected commerce experiences. We talk about first party data. I mean, the one thing I find fascinating that we don't talk about enough probably is the, that Web3 and decentralization, aka blockchain, provides new ways to secure customer data to make these experiences owned by the customer versus owned by the brand who could eventually sell their data. So you have these deep interactions. The customers are more willing to participate. There's a level of security there that didn't exist before. It starts to overcome the issues that everyone was talking about around cookies going away and you know, data privacy. And so I, I would challenge us as a business, and I would challenge our clients and our industry that maybe the future solution to all this is more tightly integrated experiences that people really, really participate in that are built on these forward-thinking technologies it kind of is a is a win for everyone across the board. The brand gets a better interaction with the client. The customer gets what they want out of experiences. There's additional value. We as an agency team get to push the boundaries and really, you know, do really amazing creative work that is fun to work right. on that really moves the needle. And it's just fun to see these different disciplines all coming together where it's no longer like, oh, the gaming conversation right it's like <laughs> and what we do in gaming so it's, it's right. a full shift um and we're just we're lucky to be in the middle of it yeah oh um just to follow up on that i mean our group's born out of innovation and digital transformation we've always thought strategically about these things we've always been at the forefront of technology we rode the wave through flash and flex. I mean, we're going back like 10, 15 years now and rich internet and what that meant. And as a reminder, people were paying, you know, like a million dollars for a 30 second flash intro because that was the beginning of moving from page based uh, web into, uh, once again, rich internet. Then things, flash was killed. Things got boring for, I would say, about a decade. <laughs> HTML, it just felt like everything went backwards. But now 3D right. is here. It is fully like um, it's actually been here a couple of years. It took I'm not kidding. I bet we did um, because it's hard to explain these things through slides. We need to make prototypes. We make demos. That's going to be a lot of fun, like watching like the customer's eyes light, light up of like, oh, this is what it could be sort of situation. Like that's yeah. going to be really gratifying for you. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. I'll use this really specific example. And I apologize in advance because we've talked about this until we're like, 
eyes are bleeding. But <laughs> four years ago, roughly four and a half years ago, we won a Grand Prix in Cannes. Cannes coming up for a project that we did with Billy Corgan uh, from the Smashing Pumpkins. And what was okay. novel about that was we it was a music video. Was, we made a music video. <laughs> okay. But we had uh, an artist named Danny Bittman create all of this ethereal content inside of Google Tilt Brush inside of a VR headset. Then we animated that content. And then we shot Billy playing the piano for a song called Aeronaut on Microsoft's Mixed Reality Capture Studio stage. So we captured him as a 3D object. We took other creative visuals inside of Unity, which is a game engine. We composited all this stuff. And then we had a, so here we have a Unity app that inside, if you watch it on a computer screen, is a 3D version of him playing the song. The background's changing. It's like a virtual stage. And then we put virtual cameras inside of the VR experience, and we we shot the video. And so online, there is a music video that is a 2D rasterized video that plays back at you, which is cool. Shot in VR. Interesting. Mm, But then we were able to take the game, the, the VR stage, out of Unreal, and be able to take you and put you in that 3D setup. And then we ran that across a bunch of film festivals and interactive experiences, and that's still available on Steam. So this idea that I can create content inside of a rendering engine, but then I can have you go inside the rendering engine. So we, so as a an homage to the technology and to our own R&D, which is really kind of the lifeblood of that project, now we start to see real-time filmmaking, leveraging Unreal and Unity, like we will, by the end of this year, be producing television commercials, quote-unquote television commercials, whatever that is anymore, inside of things like Unreal Engine or Unity and, and being able to mix and match that content. You could replay your own version of it. We can make dynamically generated content. So the city background in your commercial is different than the city background in my commercial. These things can run in banner ads. They can run as feature films. Like, oh my gosh, it's all all of these technologies and all these experiences start to converge. And if you can think of it as an ecosystem of virtual production, it sounds intimidating. But I would argue that if you do it right and you're good at it, you will save money compared to traditional production techniques, traditional web, traditional game experiences where you go everything in an individual kind of let's do this, then let's do this, let's do this. Um, when it all yep. comes together, it 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 paves the way for a really exciting future, albeit a future that not a lot of people understand, and that we have to have new talent coming out of uh, out of universities that are like a, a shifted mindset where it's like hybrid kinds of people, designers and technologists coming together. You've got a degree in fine art. And an, or it was a minor in animation and then a computer science master's or something. So we don't have these people today. And I think that the there's a huge opportunity for the next wave of people entering the job market and creative fields to do some really awesome stuff. So you guys have talked a lot about like how we create this asset, particularly for like the advertisement itself or a specific deliverable itself. But when we're talking about like media more broadly, You've you've talked a lot uh, before about just movie making um, and how we're kind of using these same types of tools and there's the potential to just make movies in this way. Can you talk a little bit more about that and, and what you mean? By Absolutely. That? So there's a fascinating convergence happening where movies are moving towards games and games are moving towards movies and advertising's in the middle. We get to pick and choose from the best of both worlds, and that's why. You know, Dave and I are talking about hopping into movies as a gaming experience because we can change the movie in real time. So what we mean by that is on the film movie side, things like The Mandalorian use an LED back wall behind them. It's no longer green screen and there are huge benefits of doing that. One, everyone can see that there's woods behind the person. Um, There's context, right, for the actors. But that real light is now reflecting on their faces. So there's there's no green glow on people as they're capturing it. It is the reflection of the woods. So things can look uh, just much better and be produced faster. That digital asset, however, that's on the, the background, um, and this ties into 
return on investment. It's not super cheap to make these things. The return on investment, and this is why we talk about multi-channel experiences, is once you've built that asset, use it everywhere. Um, that's what reduces the cost is because you can get away with not having to do a traditional suit shoot. So let's just say we make a photorealistic vehicle. Well, you can get a 360 interior render and use that on the website now. That used to be a $100,000 studio shoot. We just, that's like a side, like, oh, well, we've already got this asset. Hey, do you guys want this? Sure. Well, that's it, right? Like that's a huge benefit and reduces cost. Things can be made faster. Not to mention if there's something wrong with it, well, we don't like 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 the lighting in there. We'd like it to be, you know, more blue. We'd like it to be night. We'd like it to be day. We'd like it to have a purple background behind there. Yeah, no problem. We'll render that out in the next 30 minutes and we can have that asset updated. So the assets, once again, used in that movie, we can directly plunk into a world and there's some some modifications it's not totally like moving from one to the other a game has to be more optimized and run in real time but once again the asset we can build that world around it and have a gaming experience and for us as advertisers that you know and dave was talking about personalized commercials and things like that it's reusing those assets and stitching together a story that we now move people through multiple channels but they can make those commercials they can make a world a brand can make a world that lives um you know in a permanent land like the central land and then all of the advertising and media that connects those threads and zach i think the second part of this or where this evolves to is and and what i'm about to say is hard to do so bear with me don't expect to see it tomorrow um blending interactivity with entertainment and storytelling so I, we used to do a bunch of work with HBO, and in the course of doing that work, we did a bunch of interviews to talk about the future of how studios and creative companies are thinking about content. And there was a gentleman who we interviewed, and this sticks in my head. He was, uh, I won't give away who he is, but he was um, the creative director for a major entertainment property that deals with superheroes. And he said that when you start to mix storytelling, which they are really good at. And that's what they're they, they they do, right? They are storytellers despite the technology, despite the movie making, they tell you a story. If you take yourself away from that scripted story and you interfere with it, you're now gaming, like and I'll use a specific example, but you you run the risk of telling now a less attractive story and building a less engaging game. <laughs> so let Right now, right, game makers are game makers and storytellers are storytellers. And yes, games have stories. But the example we all would kick around, because at the time that we were working on this project, the Red Wedding episode came out, and I think it was the end of season one in Game of Thrones. And we were all shocked and appalled the day after that aired. And we were all in the office and somebody on the team said, like, God, could you imagine where a fight breaks out in the scene and you grab your Xbox controller and you jump in and you fight for your side, right? And then you participate in the action and then you jump back out and you go back to passive viewing mode. Again, could be amazing if done right. Could ruin storylines if done wrong. (laughs) But as you start to look at, and I know this sounds crazy, but the future of our of artificial intelligence and where it's going, the ability to construct storylines on the fly. It's like having a team of personal writers sitting over your shoulder, watching your interactions and and telling the storyline, but then having your storyline meet back up with everybody else's so that you have common storyline of a promise of the future that is really fascinating. I look at us, my, uh, us, wait, Zach and I particularly, because we've been working together forever and we're getting older, maybe less interesting, but for my 12 year old, I can see that like in three minutes of watch, three minutes of play, two minutes of watch, one minute of play, like that becomes really easy to understand and, and something I can see adopting. So I think that again, the, the next couple of years are going to, are going to change how all of this comes together. That's exciting. And I think we're going to see more. Listen, the the NFT craze over the last six, eight months, like we have been 
cautious with clients about diving in too deeply because we foresaw sort of a backlash in the market. We don't want to get too heavily invested in a technology or in um, tokenomics that may not have longevity or a hardware that might not make it. But overall, things like Web3, blockchain, right, underlying technologies, real-time rendering and filmmaking, LED walls, faster GPUs, your browsers becoming rendering engines in their own right, like it's all happening. So what is gaming anymore? I mean, I think it's all becomes this future of creativity and, and the, the future of experiences. The metaverse is ultimately just the, the interface layer of the future internet, right? So like, because gaming is our serious apps. I would argue that entering your time doesn't have to be like the worst web interface you've ever seen. It, it doesn't. It, it can actually be enjoyable. And it doesn't even mean that it has to be gamified or move into the world of gaming. But overall, I think creativity gets boosted. We COVID has impacted all of us. We're all a little more casual than we were before. Like, how do we move forward as a society as our personalities and attitudes have changed while our technology has changed, our expectations for experience is evolving? Like, that's all good. So, like, what do we do? is an industry to move it forward and, and leverage the best of this stuff to, to quite frankly, give people what they, they desire in this evolving world. I don't know. It's exciting. Yeah. It's an exciting time to be in this field. Totally. And you know, these things aren't new. They're just becoming more accessible and getting better and more fun to interact with. They've mentioned the Microsoft studio to make the aeronaut video. Only a handful of people get to use that. That's a thousand plus cameras filming all at once to create a volumetric video. But the idea of Machinima making movies in games, that's been around a long time, like going back to Halo, um, you know, um, and making making content in a game engine. Like that's oh, here yeah. now. It's just like at a movie quality. So the idea of accessibility, this idea of making an armchair director's cut, if that content was available, you didn't like the end of a movie, but you had access to that 3D scene and you relit it, you changed it, added a new track and said, you know what, this is how I think that movie should have ended. Now there's a new flavor out there. And that to me is still a bit of a game. You've gamed the end of a movie. You made your own spin on content. With blockchain, there could be attribution that, Here's the seed of the movie. You made this version. People might pay for that. And maybe 20% built into the contract on the blockchain feeds back into the movie. So opening the content to fans, there's value in that. And once again, um, it's all about have, thinking about how to use that content that you've already made to its max. This is the end of part one for our gaming creative episode. And we will resume this conversation in part two in two weeks. This brings us to the end of this episode of Digital Marketing Musings. If you have an idea for an episode for our 2022 season, we would love to hear it. Just drop us a note at digitalmarketingmusings at merkelink.com. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and rate and review us. It definitely helps others to find our show. And if you can, tell a friend about us. This episode was produced by Merkel with sound and video editing by Craig Zagurski. Our team includes copywriting by Onika Schliesman, graphic design by Garrett Rubel, website support by Janice Meets, and social media and promotion by Gina Astrop and Andrea Ratner. Until then, I'm Gaia Reed. Bye.